Hello, this is Dr. Gilek Seibert, and this is interview with Dr. Mike Putnam for Doc of Clock series. And uh, Dr. Putnam, is it okay if I call you Michael? Yeah, of course, please do. <laughs> Thank you so much and welcome for agreeing for this interview. Why won't you tell me a few words about yourself? Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Putman. I'm a rheumatologist at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Um, I see general rheumatology and I do some vasculitis practice there. Um, and yeah, I, I think you found me at ACR because I gave a talk about reading the medical literature and um, that's how I am here. <laughs> yes, and this is exactly how I uh, was inspired to invite you because I really liked your talk. And as you know, I was... Yeah. Um, yeah, this was really nice and useful. And I'm a fellowship program director. So I am going to ask my fellows that they watch it because I sometimes struggle with time to find uh, time for literature as, you know, busy clinician, program director. And, you know, we also have life at home and the wellness and balance. And I liked what you said during your talk during um, the recent American College of Rheumatology meeting. And you said, you know, stop reading abstract, skip intro, and skip background, but do read methods, results, table, figures. And in the discussion, you said generally skip it, but never skip limitations. Is that, I'm following you correct? Yeah, I think that's a pretty good assessment. I'd say that uh, I, I think the main thing that I encourage people to do is avoid the abstract. Because I, I think if you only read abstracts, you get a very superficial understanding of the medical literature. And so, I encourage people to spend their time elsewhere. And if I were to prioritize where elsewhere is, I would say that the methods is the most important. And when you're reading the results, you should do it efficiently by focusing on tables and figures. And then the limitations is essential because you can learn a lot about what other people thought were the problems and kind of check your own learning by reading the limitations. So I do read introductions sometimes and discussions sometimes. I bring them back if I have enough time to really to really sit and simmer with the project. But um, when, I'm in, when I'm in a hurry, instead of reading the abstract, I read the methods and the results primarily. Yeah, <laughs> so that's a pretty good assessment of what I said. Yes, no, I, I really liked it. And you know, we all in hurry, don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's just not enough hours in the day unless you find ways to be efficient when you're doing things like this. Yeah, do you have like something built in your schedule to, to you know, to do literature review, let's say like Wednesday afternoon, or how do you build it in your schedule? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't actually. Um, I uh, tend to read when I have time. And uh, if I find an article that I really want to dig into, I'll put it in a folder and then I'll go back to it whenever I have a moment. Um, I really enjoy reading papers. And so I usually <laughs> find enough time to do it. But uh, I think finding time and carving out time is, is, is one of the biggest challenges for this kind of thing. And I, I believe that you love to do that. And it's almost like your semi-professional hobby because you have also very popular ebroom.com podcast, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I like to talk about papers on a podcast. And so, uh, you know, I share those with people and um, some people listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I think that's great, especially for trainees, residents, but I would say anybody, you know, because again, you know, to have someone look into that, digest it for you, I always appreciate that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put both of us at the task here, and I followed, you know, your steps, recommendation for reviewing literature. I really wanted to review the HOPE trial that was released shortly after last year meeting, and so why won't you, I am actually going to relax here and ask you to using your method, uh, tell us about HOPE trial and whether you liked it, the design and findings, and maybe mm -hmm. I'll have another question afterwards. Yeah, sure thing. Do you want me to go through it start to finish or kind of give a, a quick overview? Quick overview, please. Okay, uh, so I, I, this was an interesting trial. I, you mentioned it before the podcast, so I had a chance to re-review it because I read it when it came out. It was, you know, I think that osteoarthritis is a challenge for all of us. Um, we have a lot of patients who suffer from it, and I think we all want to give them something, but um, there have been just a series of notable failures in this space to try to treat it. Um, our conventional synthetic demards have gone through, and uh, most recently, tocilizumab was tried and it did not help at all. So I think that uh, this is a place where all of us are interested in hoping something will emerge. Um, <clears throat> and this trial was kind of a question, you know, is immunosuppression or anti-inflammation helpful at all? Um, 
And so the way I read this, I went to the methods and I, I learned about it. And what they did is they essentially took two groups of people or well, a group of patients with hand osteoarthritis. And the, you know, this is where you start to really learn things in the methods that you wouldn't have learned in the abstract. When you read the methods, you find out that it was a very, very tightly defined group of people, right? It's not just anyone who had hand pain. You know, to in be included, you had to have multiple DIP and PIP joints with swelling. They had did power Doppler to try and find it. You had to have synovial thickening on power Doppler. You had to have pain. And then they washed out NSAIDs. So yeah. this isn't just anyone, right? It's someone they, who has... Mm -hmm. And they excluded thumb also. Yeah, and that was an interesting thing to do. Because, I mean, a lot of osteoarthritis is at the base of the thumb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so, you know what, that actually made me worry about a little bit. And this is something you should wonder about. Yeah, is that maybe they caught a lot of people with seronegative rheumatoid arthritis. You were wow. excluded if you, had, if you had an RF or a CCP. But we all know that plenty of people have rheumatoid arthritis without an RF and CCP. So um, just a concern that I had when I was reading those uh, inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, so that was roughly their population, was this narrow subset of hand OA that it has actual swelling that we can find. Yes. Um, and you know, and then what they did is they, they assigned people to either get prednisolone, basically 10 milligrams a day, um, or placebo, uh, and they followed them forward. And they did a couple nice things. One was that um, they followed them for quite some time. And two is that they did a lot of different assessments, which was, which was good. I mean, I think it's important to make sure that you ask a number of different ways about how this could have potentially helped somebody. Um, and then it was blinded appropriately, which is always important in these kind of studies. Yeah. So, you know, then after, after I, I would talk a little more about the methods, but he said a brief summary. So <laughs> skipping ahead to the results, when you scroll down, you see, uh, you know, the figures, and it's very easy to see visually what happened. Patients who got the uh, prednisolone improved on a visual analog score of pain for a while. And then once they stopped the prednisolone, they, their symptoms returned. And, you know, they had pain again. Um, it seemed to work reasonably well. Uh, the effect size was actually somewhat large if you talk about anyone who improved as a proportion, uh, but it, it, wasn't, it wasn't lasting. And so, you know, for me, this is a really interesting trial in the sense that it tells me that someone who comes in with osteoarthritis, but not any osteoarthritis, osteoarthritis with objective swelling and, and, yes. and, and pain, um, if you give them prednisolone for six weeks, they might improve on the short term, but yeah. then once they stop, they're going to go back to where they were. So I think that that's a limited, cautious finding from this yes. paper. I think the authors themselves went a little bit beyond that. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree. And obviously, you know, the steroids, who wants to really use steroids in six weeks is not a trivial amount of time, in my opinion, especially for 10 milligrams. And they also listed, you know, in the discussion period that five milligrams previously failed in other studies. So 10 milligrams was chosen for the reason. But you know, in the population that we treat, as you know, and I'm sure you, uh, you noted this problem, is that it can really cause problem with the bone loss in population who already has more osteopenia and osteoporosis, which means bone loss. So I'm going to ask you a, a question about the thumb, because you said that it was probably not the greatest thing to exclude these people. So uh, what do you think, um, what if they included this population? Do you think it would help them? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, my, my concerns about this trial are that they're catching things that aren't necessarily osteoarthritis. So if you give me a patient who has four swollen PIPs and I do an ultrasound, I see power Doppler uptake, there's a good chance I'm just going to call them seronegative rheumatoid arthritis, and I would expect them to get better. Uh, so I wonder if they're actually select by, and so then the, you know, the base of the thumb is a much less common place for RA. It's a very common place for OA. So by excluding that, in my sense, I just have this vague sense that they may have tilted it a little bit towards this phenotype of people who's more RA than is OA. And then when people read this trial, they're going to say to themselves, wow, osteoarthritis of the hands, we can use steroids for that. And I don't think that's the conclusion of this trial. So um, that's the first concern that I had with them excluding base of the thumb. Then the second concern is that a lot of patients with OA of the hand have a lot of pain at the base of their thumb. And so that is a group of people that I would be interested in treating. Uh, the authors are right that it's a different group, but um, you know, that, that, that was just a limitation of the paper that I think people who are applying it should be well aware of. So let me um, put you here for a minute in an uncomfortable uh, spot for a minute, because as you know, I know, 
here's it's coming. Uh, so the question about, you know, we use sometimes, but it's not recommended by the osteoarthritis guidelines, uh, steroid injection at the base of a thumb. So I'm going to ask you about your practice. Do you use this injection or not? Because that's, you know, similar concepts using steroids. I actually had wondered if you'd asked me about this. Uh, I uh, will say that I do not routinely do this. Uh, in my training, um, I did do it a fair bit because one of the folks I trained under um, did these injections. And I'll tell you that a lot of patients really felt like they worked. So it's one of those things where it makes me uncomfortable. It's not necessarily recommended, but I think a lot of people have or are doing it. And I think there are probably a lot of patients who feel like it helps. And um, <clears throat> you know, this goes back to uh, just how you see your role as a physician. I think that uh, there's a plausible argument that injecting the base of the thumb has a very powerful placebo effect and it makes people feel better, even if the medicines themselves aren't terribly helpful. So uh, I, you know, I think it's always hard to parse whether, uh, whether we should be doing things like that. But I, I will say that I've, I don't do them regularly, but I have done in the past and I have certainly had patients who tell me that it is beneficial. Yeah, so I think, you know, the jury is still out on that. And it sounds like we need a very good, very well-designed trial. And then the, when this trial is done and ready, I will invite you back and we'll go over and we'll digest it in a similar uh, way that we're doing it with this trial. So Sounds great. <laughs> thank you, Michael. This was wonderful. So we summarized the trial and uh, just a few final comments or talking points about the trainees, uh, whether regarding the HOPE trial specifically for osteoarthritis or literature review, some take home points. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that, uh, I thank you for coming to my talk. I, I, I put a lot of my thoughts in the talk about how to read papers. And, you know, I think that uh, my main recommendation for trainees is just to try to develop a practice where you do this in a rigorous way. Um, I think it's very easy to read the abstract and feel like you know um, something, know, know the main findings of a paper. But, uh, you know, as rheumatologists, we are often the end of the line and we're specialists. And I think that that requires us taking our uh, level of knowledge to another level. And, and for me, that, that level is, is reading the primary literature and really understanding the implications of trials like this. So uh, things like this are a lot of fun for me and I always enjoy talking to them. So thank you, thank you for having me. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much. And again, have a very nice day and I'll see you at next ACR, hopefully in person. Thank you again. <laughs> Absolutely, have a good one. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.